Hi, everybody, and welcome again to another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. I'm your host, Phil Huber, joined by Logan Whitmer and John Doyle. On today's episode, number 68, we're going to discuss some changes that are going on here at Woodsmith and Popular Woodworking Magazine, as well as some other behind the scenes details. We'll also share our weekly shop update. So I hope you enjoy today's show. This episode of the Shop Notes podcast is brought to you by Woodsmith Magazine. Woodsmith Magazine has been the trusted source for all your woodworking information for over 40 years. From tips and techniques to furniture projects to shop projects, you'll find it all at Woodsmith Magazine. Subscribe today at woodsmith.com. So are you wearing the Miami Dolphins hat in honor of the draft this weekend? Uh, Yeah, Miami has like, I don't know, the best draft picks of this draft not because we were the worst arguably but (laughs) because the miami staff is now playing a long-term game so we've Mm -hmm. traded a bunch of draft picks the last couple of years and positioned ourselves pretty Mm -hmm. well so i think between this and next year's draft we have like five first round picks i mean it's ridiculous so 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 keep your cell phone nearby you this right. weekend in case you get the call. Yep. Right. <laughs> he uh, still has eligibility left, so right. it's all right. Yeah. You know You're young. Yeah. Th- this is my only hat that's not covered in sawdust right now. So All right. It's your only non Menards hat. <laughs> it is one of my few <laughs> non Menards hats, let's be fair. <laughs> what I think is funny is we're in Iowa, which uh for the geographically challenged is in the northern part of the United States. And yet on the staff of Woodsmith Magazine slash Popular Woodworking, we have two Miami Dolphins fans. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now, art director Todd Lamberth can be forgiven for being a Miami Dolphins fan because he's (laughs) older than you are. He, Yeah, I mean, he, him and my dad were from the same era, so... Right, so he can remember Don Shula and the Dolphins being legitimate threats, the, whereas the you were born, dolphins, yep. <laughs> were whereas you were born post Marino, right? Mm-hmm. No, I watched. I got to see Marino play three games in person. Like I watched Marino oh, yeah. three games in person. Yeah, no, I. I yeah, but Marino that was retired. when he was like 53, 54, <laughs> 55 years old, though. Yeah, that was, that was post like six knee surgeries. Yeah. <laughs> you grew up in the Jay Feely era. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up with 19 or 20 different Miami quarterbacks, <laughs> yeah. which is mm-hmm. so sad to They're say due. it like that. Oh, my gosh. They are due. Yep. I mean, so I as, get... Iowa, as an Iowa native, how do you get to be a Miami Dolphins fan? Uh, I think it's probably the same way that Todd is, I'm guessing. My dad was a Dolphins fan, uh, I mean, obviously during the 72 Dolphins. Uh, you know, you got Greasy, Zonka, the undefeated team. Uh, and I think he probably was, like, a bandwagon fan, but we've been diehard ever since. And I think it's probably the same way with Todd. He's He probably right. was at that same era where, hey, they were the best team in the NFL for, you know, 10 years. Mm-hmm. And everybody latched onto him, and now here we are, forty years later. <laughs> this this was years gonna, later. <laughs> this was going to be my guess is that um, in Iowa, I believe we have more pigs than uh, people, right? And uh, I believe pigs are the dolphins of the land. <laughs> sure, okay. is, the, is they're referred to. So yeah. that's mm-hmm. that's the connection I was guessing. Yeah. So. Well, to be and to be fair, we don't have any professional sports teams in Iowa. We don't have any professional NFL teams, really anywhere close, except within like a I don't know what six hour drive. We have the Chiefs, the Three. Packers, mm-hmm. the Bears, and the Vikings. I mean, Packers are probably a little further, so we have four. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we have, so we have a weird mixture of a lot of different sporting bands around us. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Topic of today's show is kind of peeling back the curtain a little bit to see what goes on behind the scenes and to make some announcements for the wider public. 
in that Logan, who has served as, what was your title? Assistant editor? Yes. I always abbreviated it ASS period editor. And then I realized that's probably not the best way to refer to myself. But yes, assistant editor. Yes. <laughs> but now, what was that, two weeks ago? Yeah. Two, three? Mm-hmm. Two, three. You like were uh, promoted to the title of editor in chief at Popular Woodworking Magazine. Yes. Which I'm not sure how many how many listeners out there realize that our parent company is the same. So yep. we're like stepbrothers or something. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And now I, I realize that me wearing a dolphin's hat is kind of poetic for me <laughs> taking this spot too, because I must like self torture in many different <laughs> aspects, like in my sports teams, in my career choices. <laughs> so, you know, it's just something wrong with me, I think. Yeah. So. You've, you've acquired a lot of woodworking draft picks for Pop Wood and. <laughs> You're ready to rebuild. Yes. <laughs> no, so the 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 backstory for people that don't know is f- for the longest time Popular Woodworking was owned by a company out of uh, Cincinnati, right? Uh called FW Media. And probably 2 years ago now, FW declared bankruptcy. Um they were I don't know if they were an investment firm owned company or what they were exactly. Um, But they declared bankruptcy and during the bankruptcy sale, uh, active interest media who owns Woodsmith um, purchased the title. And we kind of fumbled around for a little bit, trying to figure out what we all wanted to, to do with it like kind of as a staff it was kind of brought to us saying you know what what's what's the plan for you know what do we do with two woodworking titles because on the surface it seems odd that you would have two woodworking titles or two magazines that serve the same audience but in reality there's a very um there's a very low crossover between subscribers Mm -hmm. and definitely different feels to the magazine um the magazine content and kind of the the feeling of the magazine was different. So, you know, we we decided to kind of let it stay on its own path. Um, And the the team that was at Popular Woodworking, um, Andrew, Colin, and Danielle, kind of ran it for the last, what, two years that we've owned it. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, about a month ago, a little over a month ago, it was announced that Andrew, the editor-in-chief, was leaving. Um, he was taking a marketing position with a, a company down in Virginia that makes like, um, oh, like stock cabinets for home builders and stuff like that. So he's kind of doing content creation for them, um, which good for him. I think he's going to really enjoy that, uh, that position. Um, but it was uh, brought up that we needed a new editor in chief of popular woodworking. And um, I, I thought about it and I thought, you know what? Uh, for the longest time, there was two magazines I subscribed to when I was um, younger, uh, before I was in the industry. Um, one of which was Woodsmith, and one which was Popular Woodworking. So, um, I always have this very uh, romantic idea of what Popular Woodworking used to be, um, and it used to be a, a very um, High end's not the right word, but a very pure magazine from a content standpoint. It had very traditional type techniques and stuff like that, very traditional type projects. Uh, and I really loved that. And recently, the the magazine had kind of shifted focus a little bit, so I thought it would be fun to kind of see if we could refocus it um, and kind of dive back into some good quality yeah, I, I hesitate to use the word traditional, but I guess if the shoe fits, you know, traditional type woodworking content. So, mm-hmm. yeah. and it was, it was one of those things. It was either we we got somebody from within to take the the position, or we would go outside of the company to fill it. And I think there's there's we have so much talent on our staff um, between the woodsmith and the popular woodworking and all of our other titles that. I think I, 
in my opinion, it seemed like somebody internal would be a better transition to help utilize some of that content more or some of that um, talent more than pulling somebody in from the outside. Um, so, yeah, here we are. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like lately popular woodworking has gotten the, the reputation of being more uh, maker driven and more CNC stuff and more technology based woodworking. And I don't know, you're going to try to steer away from that or just less of it or. You know, I, I, guess... I, I think it, it, I, I say this tongue in cheek because you guys know me. You guys know me on like a personal mm -hmm. level. You guys know that I'm not afraid to, to, uh, Shock and awe is a weird way to put it, but I'm not afraid to like do something stupid and have people question it. <laughs> yeah. So, so on, on that regard, it's like, I, I, I guess let me rephrase that entire thing. I like controversy, not, mm -hmm. not from like a put, you know, pitting people against each other, but I like that discussion. So, right. so I always like it when somebody asks the question like, Hey, is CNC really woodworking? Like I enjoy that banter and that, and that right. topic and, and just discussions like that. Long answer to a short question, John, I, you're right. It has definitely fallen more into the maker category but I don't think I want to necessarily continue with that trend. Does that mean that you're not going to see CNC stuff in popular woodworking? No, not at all. Because right. I think CNC is a very valid option for some people in their shops. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there will probably be less of it now um, because I I think that um, at its core, I'd, I'd prefer to focus on more uh, traditional and more approachable techniques for most people. Mm -hmm. um versus you know investing in a cnc machine which a low percentage of our readers have right. um but i think again that there's still definitely some validity and reason to include some of that in in some issues and definitely online uh, you know i think i think that's where it's much easier for us to deliver the content to the people that need that content versus hoping that somebody that has a CNC and that needs that content has a, a subscription. Whereas mm -hmm. if it goes online, they can readily access it and the right people can access it. Mm -hmm. It's true. So, yeah. Yeah. That was a long answer. It was, I know. <laughs> I know. You're welcome to everybody that hates that I talk so much. Cause I do. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we were just joking about that because we got a uh, email from uh, uh, husband and wife. It was the wife uh, that emailed in and said they were on a road trip and they were listening to our podcasts and were complaining. She was complaining that Logan talked too much, but it's like, yep, we did not put the disclaimer on the podcast that you're not supposed to listen to these back to back to back <laughs> one a week, one podcast a week. That is the the correct dosage uh, of podcasts right right enjoy so, responsibly yes which you know it's funny because i've always given my mom a lot of crap because i and i always said she likes to cut hair because she gets to stand there and talk to people all day long and mm -hmm. i always gave her so much crap for that and now i find myself in the same form it's like i just mm -hmm. talk I don't, I don't know just talk whatever Yep. Yeah. So I guess that begs the question, Phil. Right. With me taking over on popular woodworking front, we're looking for an editor, right? We are looking for an editor. Somebody who can step in as a, an assistant editor position and do quite a variety of things. Because I feel like... You know, we have job titles around here, but that They're only titles, describes yeah. like a small percentage of what exactly you do. Yep. Mm -hmm. So uh, the person that we're looking for is enthusiastic about woodworking and can write. The ideal candidate is a strong writer and a strong woodworker. 
However, as our staff has proven, I think you can go one of two ways with that. You can have uh, somebody who has a strong interest in wood in woodworking and a passion for the hobby. And your writing skills may not be top shelf, but we can, we're all here to make the magazine and whatever else we do better. So we will, we will teach. Or somebody who is a strong writer, but is interested in woodworking, but not necessarily, that's not necessarily their hobby. And if you're interested in learning about it, then, uh, then we take that too. Mm-hmm. Or you could just be like me and suck at both and fake it till you make it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think that, you know, from, from a standpoint of writing, I think we've definitely changed the Woodsmith tone over the last four or five years. Right. So right. it always used to be a very, it used to be a very rigorous um, proofreading and editing process to kind of homogenize the way everybody wrote and distill it down into one uniform voice. And we've talked about that in the past, I think. Yeah. Um, where as now we're, we're leaning more towards letting everybody's personality shine through. Like, yes, we want our writing to come across and read, you know, smoothly. We want grammar to cor be correct. We do not want errors and all that stuff. Um, but not saying the writing portion is any less important than it was in the past, but I think it's definitely more flexible than it was. Sure. So I think that's fair. Yeah. And I think personally, and this is, this is me just talking to talk. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> I think, I think the pa like the passion for the type of content we make is more important than anything. Cause I think that translates well and it, it translates across to our, our subscribers, our viewers, our listeners, our readers, you know, everybody. Uh, they could see that we are truly passionate about what we do. And if we uh, were not employed at the magazine, we would still be doing exactly what we do, just without cameras. Yeah. So, yeah. So whoever's interested in this position would also be involved with things like our online seminars podcasts. We have our Facebook live updates. Uh, there's a possibility of being incorporated into the TV show, uh, working with our social media presence, uh, creating content for the web, whether it's uh, simply just words and photos or video or whatever. So we're, we have a wide variety of things that I've been wanting to do with the magazine for a long time and, mm -hmm. and being involved in a variety of media and whoever would join us as an assistant editor would be involved with all of it. Mm -hmm. For both Popwood and Woodsmith probably, right? Uh, probably. I think there would be mm -hmm. a strong amount of crossover. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. And you know, I, I know not to get back on the Popwood thing, uh, but to get back on the pop wood thing real quick, um, I think that one of the biggest questions that people have and one of my biggest, um, not necessarily concerns, but one of my biggest points of focus is I don't want, and nobody, nobody wants the Woodsmith and pop wood titles to end up being the same magazine. Right. Like completely different content, completely different stories, completely different feel. <laughs> Uh, there's a read it there. There will be a reason to have both subscriptions, I guess, is, is what I'm getting at is yeah. you're not going to see the same project appear in both magazines. You're not going to see the same, same techniques appear in both magazines. Um, you might see the same people occasionally, you know. Yeah. Well, Phil looked at me because, yes, there is only so many woodworking techniques <laughs> that you can do, but you're not going to have the you're not going to have a a copy and pasted article because that's not the flavor of the magazines, right. yeah. either one of them. So, you know, but it is fun to see, uh, to, to be able to give people a little bit more creative liberties, I guess, with some of the popular woodworking stuff. Um, you know, Dylan's Dylan Baker's been doing projects for both magazines for a while now. Um, you can definitely see where his interests lie 
in the popular woodworking projects. Whereas we kind of set a, a schedule of projects or a matrix of projects for Woodsmith and assign each of those projects to a designer to, to design and build them. Um, whereas, you know, I don't want to say Dylan's just been turned loose on popular woodworking stuff, but he's been pretty much just turned loose. Like, hey, what are you interested in making? Make it. Um, and let's see if people like it. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's by uh, design or by his interests or coincidence, but he has done more chairs and lamps in the last <laughs> two years than I think we've done at Woodsmith in probably four, 10 years. Yeah. So he's our chair and lamp guy. And I, which I think those are like the hardest things to design, especially chairs. Cause they're, yeah, definitely designed to be ergonomic and it's hard to get those proportions and angles and stuff without building a prototype and trying it out and going back and forth. So kudos to him for, for doing that. And then with lamps and stuff, it's always hard sourcing parts. Cause it seems as like, as soon as we source a part, they go out of stock or they go out of business yeah. or, or something. So it's always well, that's, a challenge. Yeah, that that's one thing that we've had with not only lamps, but like <laughs> I had an email last week from a guy trying to uh, build a, it was one of the like 1970s, maybe early eighties woodsmiths plans. And he's looking for a hardware kit. I'm like, Hey, this company has been out of business for 25 years now. Like yeah. here's, <laughs> here's some parts that I think you could probably make work. You're just going to have to use your ingenuity a little bit mm. to figure out exactly how they're going to fit. But yeah, that's that's a hard thing, um, you know. Like even reusing some of the. So to elaborate a little bit on the F and W thing, F and W over the years had bought a bunch of different titles as well. So mm -hmm. F and W not only owned Popular Woodworking, but they owned you know American Woodworker. Or they owned a bunch of different titles. So yeah. over the last couple of years. Some of those good quality projects and departments were have been put into popular woodworking. And another one was I had a guy email in about a it was an American Woodworker project that was in popular woodworking a couple issues ago. Actually, it was a tip. And he was like, hey, where do I find these leg brackets at? I'm like, yeah, eBay? In their, <laughs> under the vintage <laughs> hardware category, maybe? I don't know. Because, you know. I probably yeah. have one in my desk drawer I could check. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. But yeah. yeah. So I guess if anybody wants to come live in Des Moines, Iowa, it's beautiful mm -hmm. outside today. It's going to be yeah. like 40 degrees in a couple days, probably. It might snow. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it's the woodworking capital of the world now. I would. Basically. Yeah. 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 So three major woodworking titles all in the same town. Yeah. Hopefully, it's going to become an old Western shootout here. In that's the next what I was going to say. Months. Hopefully <laughs> woodworking civil war doesn't break out. Yeah. But it's probably more of... like West side story. We'll just do dance fights. Oh, so. okay. I've seen Phil twerk. I, I had jar bets on us. <laughs> wow. Or no, you didn't twerk. No, sorry. You weren't twerking. You were flossing. Sorry. Mm. Saw Phil now floss. Sorry. I can't <laughs> unsee that with my mind's eye. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry to your family for having to deal with that, Phil. That mental wow. image I just gave them. <laughs> oh. There we yeah, go. There yep. it is. This is why people write mm -hmm. in and complain about me. Yep. So this was a fun last podcast. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so does this mean that you are no longer involved with Woodsmith? I tried that, but that didn't work. Um, <laughs> no, it actually, I mean one of the one of my demands can i call it a demand that makes me sound really cool one of my demands yeah, you, was you could totally call it a demand okay one of my demands was i wanted to continue to write one small project per issue for woodsmith okay. um just because i you know that's the title i i learned to to work at a magazine at so i i'd prefer to keep one one project <clears throat> so i'm gonna continue to write one project per issue um one of the smaller projects uh and still do obviously tv show stuff um and our video edition, um, we're going to try to start uh, the poor, the poor 
popular woodworking YouTube channel has not had any new content on it for years now. I mean, mm-hmm. they just haven't had the, the, the team at popular woodworking in the past just has not had the manpower or the equipment to produce video. So the, I'm going to start hitting the popular woodworking content pretty hard, but you will still see me on Woodsmith content for sure. Mm-hmm. Suckers. Yeah. So can we build popular woodworking projects on video and yeah, I think I don't see do why not. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe and yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We have, I mean, and there's some really cool like American woodworker projects that are really awesome that I think would be uh, good video projects and stuff. So, mm-hmm. um, and I mean, you know, not dwelling on the past and looking f- forward. Uh, I'm trying to work with a couple of people that I would like to start writing some popular working articles and projects and stuff uh, that I think would be really fun to bring to video as well. Mm-hmm. So I guess the same call goes out to the audience that not only are we working, looking for an editor, you're probably looking for some freelance oh, yeah. writing as yep. well. Yeah. If anybody, I think, interested. I think probably for both titles, mm-hmm. what you say, Phil? Yes. Um, we have uh, department articles, which are the non-project articles that um, I'm looking to incorporate other voices, <clears throat> other styles of work, you know, approaches to woodworking, you know, exploring some of the other uh, other branches of woodworking that we just don't have the expertise in-house for. And I'd like to highlight both that work and the people who do it. Mm-hmm. All right. So do you feel like you're drowning yet? You know, so to be honest with you, not not yet. Um, there were a lot of dominoes stacked before I left, or before I entered, um, before Andrew left. So there was a lot of pieces in play already. Stuff is moving. I, I'm definitely having to shift into a different mindset versus Woodsmith. Because um, Woodsmith, it was definitely a... The stuff we do with Woodsmith is usually very fixed, um, as far as the beginning of the issue, you know what's there. You know what departments we have. You know what, what articles we're going to be writing about. You know what the projects are. Uh, popular woodworking as a entity is a little bit more reactive, meaning that a lot of the content is leaning on contributing writers. So if contributing writers don't get their stuff in on time, then you got to react to it. Um, sure. Or if an article got published in a previous issue that had the wrong name in the headline, you got to react to it and maybe mm-hmm. republish that article. Um, maybe. So yeah, so it's it's definitely different. Um, it's definitely <laughs> it's definitely a lot. And, and I knew this, and this is something you know that I was kind of looking forward to was that I knew the editor in chief spot at Popular Woodworking. Yeah, there is a large portion of that. That's going to be some content creation, video, uh, print, all that stuff, projects. Uh, But a larger portion of that is kind of relationship building, um, which I I really enjoy. I I like meeting people. I like hanging out with people. Obviously, I like talking. So I like uh, like the the interaction between us and our our partners in the industry, um, whether they are um, sponsors or tool manufacturers that, you know, we might be showcasing their tool or other people in the industry. Uh, I've had four or five different authors that have sent me books in the last couple of weeks wanting endorsements or to sh- just share the book they're working on and wanting to push it out in the magazine a little bit, kind of like we've done on once with, um, I just like the, I like the networking of it. So, uh, drowning, no treading water with a child around my neck. Yes. <laughs> that's more what it's like and more children being thrown at you all the time <laughs> yes and you're trying to grab the children and then some of them are kind of starting to swim on their own and pushing them away and stuff yeah yeah so yeah but no i'll be i'll be interested to see uh if we get any um comments or letters from people or emails i will probably get some letters um but emails or comments from people uh hopefully that see the the shift that i'm trying to make in the popular woodworking content and hopefully i get some feedback good bad indifferent 
from it. So, sure. you know, just trying to revive uh, and build it back up to what I remember it as. And then what I remember it as may not be what other people want it to be, but yeah, we'll see. Okay. So, yeah. And it's going to take time. It's not like you can. Oh yeah. 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 It's definitely going to take time because as I said, there were a lot of stuff already in play. So there's a lot of articles that were, um, uh, agreed upon that they'd be written. So mm-hmm. some of those are kind of placed out. And I mean, it is kind of fun to see there, see five or six issues ahead of stuff that's already here. So it's one of those things it's like, Oh, Hey, we can, as soon as this issue goes to the printer, we'll just start working on the next one and get that one in layout. And, mm-hmm. you know, so readers will probably see the larger changes in the next six months to a year. Yeah, probably. I would say the in the next year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think, I think so. Um, I think that's when a lot of that will start taking into effect. So, yeah, cool. but there are, <laughs> there are some really cool projects. Uh, again, it's, it's one of those things that I really enjoy the, uh, seeing other woodworkers that are like amazing woodworkers that you just would have never heard of. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like otherwise. Um, and that's, it's kind of like uncovering hidden little gems. And I mean, I, you know, I don't mean to say that sounding like people are objects, but you know, you find these people that are really, really masters of their craft, but you just, you would have never heard of them otherwise. So mm-hmm. being able to share some of those people um, with with everybody, I think, will be really, really mm-hmm. fun. So, yeah, and that's a lot easier nowadays with social media and oh, people yeah. putting stuff out there, and lots of little n- niches and of woodworking that you know that you might not be involved in, but then you find and it's really cool, and you can yeah. learn something new, and so yeah. Well, it's like we we talked. Uh, we had um, we've had a couple of guests on in the last handful of well, in the last year we've had a bunch of different guests that kind of came from different backgrounds and were kind of cool. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Danielle is one of them. You know, most people may not have heard heard of her, mm-hmm. but she has a very very specific niche that's really cool. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, so here's a poll question for today. Okay. Uh, before coming into my office to do the podcast, I was working in the video studio. And uh, I have a video project on a workbench that I'm trying to not get behind on prop and part preparation for so that when we do shoot, it can be pretty timely. Um, and because I really want this workbench in my shop sooner rather mm-hmm. than later. Yeah, because I have way too many things that just kind of loiter. Um, and I was cross cutting parts on the miter saw in the shop, mm-hmm. the one that John's looking at right now. And was here. So the poll question is: table saw or miter saw for cross cuts? Why? Um, for me, it's usually like really big pieces that don't need to be as accurate or clean a cut. I'm on the miter saw smaller pieces as in three feet or less in length. Um, I'm usually at a table saw cause I feel like I control the, the cut a little bit more, get it more square, uh, more crisp as far as, um, any chip out and stuff. I feel like that's table saw work. Okay. I don't know. I am a, I said this in the last issue of Woodsmith. I don't remember what project I was talking about. Oh, the bathroom cart. I really like a good quality miter saw with a good sharp blade for Mm -hmm. finished cross cuts. Okay. Um, And I like it because now I'm I'm strictly basing this off of if it was in my shop table saw, mm-hmm. because I don't have a large miter saw station, but in our production shop we have a very nice miter saw station with I believe is it that Beesmeyer miter saw wings yes. on it? Um, yeah, I love that thing. Uh, we have the big twelve inch Bosch gliding miter saw. Yeah, 
Yep. Uh, the blades that are in it are not always the best, <laughs> but I like the rail system on there, and I can set a stop. Like you have a hard time setting a stop for, let's say, a sixty-inch part uh, for the table saw, right? Like right. it's mm-hmm. hard to to make a stop block sixty inches out. You can do it, but it's hard. Um, so, you know, just thinking about the the garden planters I'm working on right now, they're they have sixty-inch long rails. I cut all. There's four per four boxes, so I cut sixteen of them at forty in or at sixty inches. I just threw that on the miter saw and just slid till I hit the stop, made the cut. Mm, and with sure. a with a quality blade, you get a very clean cut. Um, and it is rare, unless it's like a drawer, that my end grain for most things are exposed. If that makes sense, um, mm-hmm. like if I'm cutting face frame parts or case parts. That end grain's always hidden, so I don't necessarily care if it's a super clean cut as long as I can clean up the faces. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I'm yeah. a miter saw nine times out of ten. If I'm in my shop, table saw, but miter saw most of the time. Yeah. And like you kind of mentioned that uh, the miter saw often gets used and abused and doesn't always have the best blade in it or might have cut through a staple or a nail or something. Yep. But um, before I had a table saw at my house, I took a little bit better care of my miter saw and had a good blade in it and cutting trim and stuff. So yeah, it, it did a lot better, but most of the time it seems like it's just cutting through whatever. So it doesn't always have the sharpest blade. So that's yeah. another factor, I guess. Well, I think you can do some things to your miter saw that really help you get a better cut off of it where you can make... Mm-hmm. Where I think if a, with a good blade and if you make a zero clearance insert and a zero clearance fence for your miter saw, yeah, I think that you can get as clean a cut as the table saw. Mm-hmm. I would agree with that. Um, so, you know, I guess it depends on how you work in your shop. It may not be for everybody, but that's what I prefer. Now, w- would you ever take a real arm saw over a miter saw? <laughs> like a serious uh, this is a serious question because i've been i've been looking for a large radial arm saw. i think i've told you guys this yeah i've been looking mm-hmm. for a large radial arm saw for rough cutting lumber and rough cutting turning blanks yeah mm-hmm. is that well, uh, is that the only valid point of them in your shop they can almost replace so. every tool <laughs> the old ones could i mean they, they could rip <laughs> you could rip and Router head they, attachment for yeah, them and stuff. Head yeah, and, sanders. Yeah, yeah, all kinds of stuff. No, I, what I think is kind of funny is, you know, and I think we're guilty of it too in some of our articles about the miter saw, is that you can do a, a lot of things with a miter saw. And, you know, a lot of times I think it just gets somewhat dismissed as a, I bought 12 foot boards at the lumber yard and I need to buck them down into three and four foot pieces for project components where they'll mm-hmm. later get cleaned up at the table saw. But that's based purely on tradition. I think for yeah. the magazine is that we've always been, or Woodsmith anyway, has been very table saw centric yep. sometimes to a fault. Yep. And but then on the other hand, you know, we'll do an article on miter saw upgrades. And the first thing we talk about is adding some like 80 or 100 tooth count blade yeah. to it. But if you're just hacking apart boards, having a 80 or 100 tooth blade is probably counterproductive. Yep. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like you would need either you need to get comfortable changing blades on your miter saw you know, one blade for just rough cutting and another blade for fine cross cuts and miters. Yep. And, or you have some other kind of setup for rough cutting, like a radial arm saw. Yep. Especially Mm -hmm. if it's a big, you know, old lumber yard, you know, 12 or 14 inch blade or something like that. Well, and that's, and that's kind of what I'm thinking because I have started selling, uh, fairly large quantities. Actually, my first load has to go to the kiln this weekend. Um, fairly large quantities of cut and sealed 
turning blanks. So, you know, 40 or, or 50 blanks that are 8 by 8 by 3 inches thick or 12 by 12 by 2 inches thick. And I, I can rough everything to size on my mill, but the cross-cutting them down to the 8 by 8 and 12 by 12 is what it's going to take the longest. Now, a miter saw would do it just fine. Yeah. Um, but I just think a big old cast iron three horse radial arm saw sounds amazing. <laughs> you just you turn it on that induction motor kicks in and it's like, like, I just, I don't know. I think it would be a good way to rough cut some of those big parts. And some of the big boards will have quite a bit of tension in them and they'll be warped and twisted a little bit. Uh, yeah. And sometimes, at least those Boshes that we have, the glides, that's a powerful motor. And if it pinches, it about throws you, your shoulder out when it pops you mm-hmm. with it, you know? Yeah. Well, that's uh, any miter, miter saw. I feel yeah, like yeah is, that's true. Can bind, you know, if the piece binds on it. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, you know, my, my high school actually had a... No, um, I can see that. My, actually, my high school actually had a miter, or a... Uh, uh, radial arm saw that we we used during cl- shop class, and thinking about it now, with how many people are like, "Oh, radial arm saws are dangerous," we were doing we we're plowing dados with that bad boy. You put the dado stack in that, mm-hmm. and we were doing dados oh, yeah. in our sh- little shelves we made. It was great. It worked out awesome. I don't I don't know. Mm-hmm. And to me, it seems more accurate if you're moving the saw head through a workpiece than moving the workpiece across the table, unless it's on a sled. Um, but mm-hmm. I always feel like there's always a little bit of slop in a sled or a little bit of drag on a workpiece as you're pushing it. Whereas if you're yeah. holding yeah. the workpiece and moving the head, that seems a little bit tighter action to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially if you have a really long work piece and you're trying to yeah. balance it and it's hanging off the table and supporting that and getting it to slide across the table without twisting or binding. Yep. So yep. definitely helps there. I will say sure. for, for miter cuts, table saw all day. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, because I feel like I can more accurately dial in a either a miter like let's say a bevel cut with you know say you're beveling the end of a panel you could do that yeah. easier at the table saw in my opinion oh that way or right. even even making a like a miter cut a 45 degree cross cut um i don't i don't yeah. trust i don't trust the the stops on a miter saw usually yes you can adjust them but i've never taken the time to do that instead i'll grab my incra miter gauge that has designated tooth marks at every single degree increment or every five degree increments. And I sure. feel like that's a, a more accurate mm-hmm. way to do it. So, yeah, for me, it's a no for miter cuts. What just is in general? Every, no, just, just everything. <laughs> just, yeah, no. just nothing. No, no miter cuts. cuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would agree with that. Yeah. Fair enough. It's just avoid avoid him as as much as possible. Yeah. Well, filming the TV show this week, Phil, you you were gluing up the lid on something, and I, I you just look up and say, "I hate miters," <laughs> or <laughs> miters are stupid, or something like that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's fair enough. Fair enough. I guess it depends on what you're doing. Because I was uh, I had a lid for a craft box that we were making, and it's a plywood panel four miters in the corners and a lot of times i'll do it with if when it's small pieces like that i have a hand miter box at home with a handsaw yeah and i'll do that and i can get pretty decent cuts with it it's just the you know not only does the angle of the cut have to be exactly right but the lengths of all four pieces have to be exactly right otherwise you get these odd and ugly gaps that appear and Unfortunately, when they're small pieces like that, you're looking at them this close yep. and you really feel you really start seeing differences and gaps and things like that, that most people aren't going to see. Yep. Although I will say that stupid pole saw miter box, you used it for that block on the show. I have one <laughs> that you guys built on the show or video edition 
number of years before I started. Stupid thing works so freaking well. I feel like you yeah, can. It works like a champ. You can very accurately hit a miter. I've I've started using my shooting board a lot more to fine tune parts, and I need to build a couple of accurate angle stops for it so I can do like miter trimming on it. And I think that would be my yeah. my my dead accurate go to process. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's usually what I use is I have a small miter box that I use with a with a pull saw and then I have a larger vintage um, I don't even remember who makes it now or who made it miter box kind yeah. of set up as a miter station and I use that sometimes for cross cutting parts but mostly for when I do need to you know wrap molding around a, a case or something yep I even trimmed out our living room with crown molding and brought that hand miter box into the house and set it up and did all, all the sprung joints with it. And that was tons of fun. Cause that, you know, pine molding and, you know, it's just kind of yep. fun, fun cuts to do. And with a, you know, I wasn't blowing sawdust all over the house either. Mm-hmm. All right. What do you guys got working on in your shop? John? Who, me? Sure. Yes. Go first. Uh, <laughs> so I've been working on the kids' playhouse, getting that trimmed out and finished up. But I have all of the, I don't know, just really big pieces of, is it the sheet, like, siding? Oh, yeah. It's called, like, the whatever, 211. Team, whatever, siding. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, I can't let any of those pieces go because it's, like, worth, it's like, $10,000 now. So... <laughs> <laughs> It is. It's gold. So I got, but it's like taking way too much room in my garage. So I'm starting on some planter boxes because uh, it's spring and uh, my kids' guinea pigs need vegetables, apparently. (laughs) Mm -hmm. My kids don't eat vegetables, but the guinea pigs do. So um, my daughter wants someplace to plant vegetables. So I'm taking that extra siding and some uh wood i have laying around and building some planter boxes so gotta keep this farm going there you go nice so like real life farmville yep is that still a thing i don't, I don't know i don't know i don't know probably probably well that's becky logan well i'm also working on planter boxes um working on some big ones that are like three foot deep three foot tall six feet long uh and I'm making them out of the cedar I cut in the fall. Uh, and I do need to buy a little bit of extra cedar to finish the top rails. Um, which I realize now, if I had to buy the cedar to build these planter boxes for the friend of mine, it would have been thousands of dollars. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I have to buy, I think, eight 2 by 6 by 10 foot cedar pieces. And that's like $300 for, mm-hmm. for the eight pieces. It's like, holy buckets that's crazy mm-hmm. um but i'm working on those i should hopefully i'm hoping to finish those up this weekend they're for mother's day which would be the following weekend um but mm-hmm. i'm hoping i should be able to finish those up i do have to run out and do a little bit of sawing tomorrow uh, taking a half day off i have to go saw a pin oak for a lady who is having some stuff made out of it um but yeah other than that, I still haven't touched cool. any of my lumber that I bought for my wife's office built-ins. That was a failure on my Good. part. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's only going to accrue in value. Which is, right. that's it's completely investment. true. It's an investment. Yeah. yeah. Which, I'd just go take it back. Yeah. And take, take, take the, uh, uh, no receipt return. <laughs> you know, sell out. Yep. Well, yeah. Y- yeah. it's it's funny. I saw something today, and I have not fact-checked this, so I don't know how true this is. But it says it was a it was post on Facebook, so it's probably true. Building a twelve yeah. by twelve, yeah, building a twelve by twelve deck in April twenty twenty cost was nine hundred thirty seven dollars. Building a twelve by twelve deck April twenty twenty one, it was over three thousand dollars. Now I don't know how accurate that is. But three mm-hmm. times material cost increase, 
follows in line with what I've seen at the yeah hardware store. That yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. That's, yeah. That's I nice. sold all my Bitcoin to invest in lumber. So mm-hmm. yes, that's true. That's yeah. where it's at. Yep. Mm-hmm. Crypto lumber. Yes. <laughs> We're gonna have to come up with some yeah. good name for that. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. All right, Phil. What are you working right, on? Well, my hope. Well, I've already talked about my workbench project. That's sort of a personal project, sort of a work project. Um, I also have finished refinishing a couple of stands that we got from my father-in-law. So I'm going to be plant stands in the house. They were, that was kind of fun to work on that, where it's just the finish that you're working on. Mm-hmm. All the rest of it was in decent shape. Uh, and I'm hoping that this weekend I'll have the dresser done. So I glued up a couple more shelves for it. Just have to finish up the plying finish on it and then install the drawers, move it into position, and boom, it's done. Those were what I saw glued up in the shop the other day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The edged pieces? Yeah. Is that those? Yeah. Okay. I was wondering what those were for. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. It's just some extra, a couple extra uh, shelves for that. Sure. And uh, I'm also going to be starting to, speaking of edge gluing, going to be edge gluing some other plywood to make another case piece. So hmm. keep your eyes peeled for that. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. I think that wraps up today's episode of the Shop Notes podcast. If you have any questions, comments, or smart remarks, we'd love to hear them. You can leave them in the comments section on the YouTube version of this podcast. Otherwise, you can catch our podcast wherever you find podcasts through Apple, Google, Stitcher, Spotify, other high tech words, wherever you find them. Your local podcast distillery, that kind of thing. In addition, if you're thinking about joining the Woodsmith or Popular Woodworking team as an assistant editor, we'd love to hear from you, too. You can find out how to apply uh, at careers.aimmedia, A-I-M, media.com. Or if you want to contribute to either Popular Woodworking or Woodsmith Magazine, you can email us, woodsmith at woodsmith.com. I don't know if Logan, you got a, you got a popular woodworking one. Uh, probably haven't gotten that far yeah. into this Woodsmith journey at yet. Woodsmith.com. <laughs> that's, that's the one to go with. Otherwise we'll see you next week on the shop, Co- shop notes podcast. Bye everybody. This episode of shop notes podcast is brought to you by Woodsmith plans. You'll find nearly a thousand plans covering everything that you'd want to build. Furniture projects to gift projects, kitchen accessories, workshop projects and jigs and more. Find your next project at woodsmithplans.com.